All right, what have we got going on today? I am going to do something totally different. Um, in the last just a couple of days, um, I started to experiment with uh, hooking up one of these Apple SCSI external CD-ROMs that I acquired from uh, kind of a, a, a cache of old Macs that I got from some in-laws. And uh, I got it hooked up to my CMD hard drive. So the CD-ROM is just below the CMD hard drive, which is here. And um, there are two ways that a Commodore 64 can use a SCSI CD-ROM um, that I know of. There's one, one way is called, um, I'm going to turn this CD-ROM on. So one way is called uh, CD-ROM Commander. That lets you read a, um, okay, there's nothing in there right now. So CD-ROM Commander lets you read a, uh, a data disk. So let me grab a data disk. Okay, so I have this uh, Microsoft Combat Flight Simulator program here. Don't ask me where I got this. It actually came with the, with the Macs, um, even though it's for PC. So, um, with the disk in the drive, we can go to our, uh, we can open CD, uh, CD-ROM Commander. So, how do I organize my files on my CMD hard drive? You can do at dollar sign equals P to see a partition directory. So these are all the partitions on my CMD hard drive. The default is one, it's my C64 OS and C64 OS development uh, partition. Um, plus I have tools, networking, games, demos, graphics, audio, a uh, couple of partitions for wheels, productivity for random productivity apps. So I like to put lots of my sort of common tools in partition two. So we can go CP2, at CP2 to change to partition two. So I've got, you know, dumps of uh, the standard floppy disk tools for the RU and the mouse and the, the, the disk drive uh, demo disks. And I've got a directory for archivers and uh, big blue readers for reading PC floppies. Um, I've got the CMD utilities for RAM link and super CPU and hard drive and a bunch of other stuff. Plus I have some standard like file copying like uh, draw a copy and uh, D64 it and uh, Supermon's a, a monitor. Uh, I've got all the promenade tools for the C1 promenade in there. Uh, you know, lots of stuff. Anyway, um, in here we have this CDCOM directory. So we'll go into CDCOM. Very short. Uh, list, directory list. So we'll load this up. Um, <clears throat> so this is saying that, uh, so uh, the CMD hard drive is detected as device eight. Um, source, it says no CD, I believe. And that's because we need to do this. To, so search for the hard drive and the CD drive connected to it. So it starts by saying, yeah, it's device eight, and it scans through, and it goes, oh, look at that, it found it on uh, SCSI device three. What is it doing? Okay, it appears to have locked up. Let's try this again. Wow, that was weird, eh? All right. 64738 is the universal reboot command. Let's go back into CD com. Let's run that again. Not entirely sure what happened there. That's better. 
This looks like German for active. So I'm going to save those settings. That's got to be German. Okay, so that saved the settings. So now we can say uh, uh, F3, the source menu. So we can say initialize the CD-ROM. The CD-ROM spins up, starts to read in some sectors. Now we can hit this directory. And lo and behold, here's the, uh, the Windows CD-ROM. So that's pretty cool, right? Anyway, um, I suppose I could, you know, make some sort of a C64 OS version of uh, CD-ROM Commander. But to be honest, I don't really want to do that. What I really want to do, so now I'm going to um, pop that disk out. Okay, so there's our flight simulator disk. What I really want to do is um, put in an audio CD. This is garbage, version 2. Now, for this, we're going to look at our uh, partition directory again. And we see we have an audio partition. So we'll head on over to the audio partition, CP7, where I have a bunch of audio related stuff. And here we have this CD player directory. We'll go to CD player. Now we have, uh, D, D is the German version. This program listed first, um, it will go through a SCSI device detection routine, which takes some time because it's written in basic. Then it does some self-mod on the program and it saves a copy of it as this program. So the only difference between this and this is that this one here has the um, has the last detected SCSI device and unit number pre-loaded into the program. So we're just going to load that. Okay. So now it so this is a basic program. This is this is what we're working on here. Um, this is a basic program, and what it does is it issues commands to the CMD hard drive over the hard drive's command channel, channel 15. Um, and one of the channels that you can send, one of the commands you can send to the CMD hard drive is the S-C command, which stands for SCSI command. Now that's all documented. That is all documented in this, which is the CMD hard drive uh, user manual. So if we flip back here to command reference, we have software swapping, real-time clock, SCSI commands. Sending SCSI commands. The HD has, the hard drive has, a built-in command which will allow those familiar with the SCSI common command set to send these commands directly to the HD. We will not attempt to dis okay, so here we go. That that this is you can use SCSI commands. Sorry, you can use the SC command to send commands directly to the CMD hard drive's internal SCSI hard drive mechanism, which is probably what it was originally for. Um, we will not attempt to discuss all the various commands which make up the SCSI command set as doing so could easily double the size of this manual and very few users would be served by this information. We will describe here the DOS command necessary to send SCSI commands to the host controller located in the HD. So the host controller, yeah, it's a bit confusing, right? Like inside a CMD hard drive, there's the SCSI hard drive Mac to which you can send SCSI commands. And then there's also the, um, the actual PCB that runs along the bottom that is kind of the SCSI host controller. Uh, but they seem to just kind of mix those up, right? They, they, they mix up the name of the hard drive mechanism, which is not made by CMD, 
and the whole contraption with the with the enclosure and power supply and switches and ports, Commodore ports and stuff, as the HD. Okay, <clears throat> we will describe here the DOS command necessary to send SCSI commands to the host controller located in the HD. We will call this the SCSI send command. And the syntax is, this is, I mean, this is just basic code for opening channel 15 on the device and then sending s-c, that's the SCSI command, command. Or, or send command? What, what did it call it? SCSI send? No. So SC has got to be for SCSI command. And then uh, a series of chars. And then they list the, the, what the points of these are. So um, DE, device number of the SCSI device. Okay. So basically SCSI, the CMD hard drives, PCB, Thing that runs along the bottom of the inside of the chassis of the hard drive box. Uh, it's a SCSI controller that can have up to, I don't know, probably seven SCSI devices. Then the HD mechanism in there is assigned some ID, like, I don't know, probably zero. But then there's a 25 pin SCSI uh, DB25 port on the back of the hard drive to which you can hook up a zip drive or a CD-ROM or an, an external hard drive. And then those devices can have their own device numbers. So uh, their own SCSI bus device numbers. So by specifying this uh, device number in the SCSI command, you can, although you are sending commands to what you consider your CMD hard drive, you get to, the CMD hard drive is actually a SCSI controller. So you get to specify which SCSI device you want that controller to talk to. Okay, the next thing here. So byte low of the SCSI data buffer in the, in the hard drive's RAM. So again, the hard drive's RAM. That's not the hard drive, the SCSI hard drive. That's the CMD hard drive. Which, by the way, I believe has 64 kilobytes of RAM, which is a hell of a lot more than something like the 4K that's available in 1541. So we have the low and high bytes. So we have the 16-bit address for where the SCSI data buffer should be found inside the uh, CMD HD. And following that, we have the CB command bytes, the SCSI command bytes. And I'm not yet sure how many of those you can send or what they mean. Reading the error channel immediately after sending a SCSI command to the HD will return a single byte representing the SCSI command completion status. Status byte values and definitions even so okay check condition, target busy, intermediate okay, reserved for con reservation conflict, and DOS syntax error. All right, have we got any more SCSI commands? Literally, I don't see any more SCSI commands. It's as though there's only one SCSI command. So that's pretty damn easy, right? We have SC, S-C rather, the SCSI device number, 16-bit buffer address inside the RAM of the hard drive, and then a bunch of command bytes. And then we have one status byte. I don't honestly know how you read data uh, from, I don't know how you get status data from a SCSI device, but we're gonna look at the source code of this program to figure that out. Anyway, just to show how it works, um, this basic program has uh, just sent the necessary SCSI commands to read the table of contents um, again, so the CMD HD manual, it says that it, well, it doesn't want to give us the whole SCSI command set because it's huge, right? And I don't want to go reading the whole SCSI command set and understanding it because it's huge. But this basic program has already implemented what we need, so I'm going to essentially reverse engineer it. And we're going to do that in real time on this video. So let's just see how this works. I will hit uh, 3 because I want to hear song number 3. All right, here we are. So you can hear the music playing. Um, and we get some 
information here. Now, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a bit, it's a bit loud. I believe. Yes. If we look at our CMD hard drive, there is a channel open and the basic program is basically, uh, it's reading commands just got the command channel open and it's just repeatedly sending commands to the CMD hard drive and then it's checking to see if you're pushing one of these keys and if you're not it just loops and it uh, pulls the device again to get this sort of time remaining and time spent which I think is coming directly from the SCSI device so we're gonna quit playing that okay and now we're going to just exit the program because we've seen enough Okay, so now to, uh, fortunately this program is quite well uh, commented, but nothing is commented well enough to just understand it immediately. So we are going to make extensive use of paper and pencil to try to figure out what the heck this program does. All right, so the program is in memory. We can list it. Now, uh, <clears throat> there are two, um, there are two essential things that we need to figure out. A basic program is composed of a, a well-structured basic program. So let's hope to God this is a well-structured basic program, but a well-structured basic program will consist of subroutines and each subroutine is going to do a specific thing. So you can, you can think of that as like a function with a function name. Um, and, but instead of having a function name, it's going to have a starting line number. So we need to basically document all of the functional subroutines in the program. And some of them, it will not be obvious exactly where the border is. And some of them, it will not be obvious exactly what that subroutine is for or what we should call it. But basically, we're just going to name all of the subroutines so that later in when we're analyzing parts of the program and it says, oh, go to line 2000, we go, oh, OK, that's uh, that's going to uh, pull the buffer, whatever. I, I don't know. Just making that up. The second thing <clears throat> that we need to do is uh, basic, all basic variables are globally scoped. Now, you would think that that's terrible, but that's just how basic works on the Commodore 64. And so um, the other thing about uh, basic variables is that while it is possible to use variable names that are longer than two characters in your source code, it is really only to help you understand what the variable is, is, is all about because variables are only looked up using the first two characters. So most basic programmers, as soon as they figure that out, they limit themselves to only using two characters for variable names. Believe it or not, this is actually one of the things that I find more convenient about um, assembly programming than uh, basic, because in assembly your labels can be way longer than two characters, whereas in basic, you know, you're basically limited to these two character very non-descriptive uh, variable number uh, variables. So um, yeah, so let's just uh, let's just read the comments and work our way through. So we have looks like we have uh, this is kind of a bit weird here, right? So whenever you have a routine that starts with a bunch of rems, you know something could go to one thousand and it's just going to go <laughs> fall through all these rems. However, that wouldn't be the most efficient thing to do. So my guess is that if this is a routine, they're going to go to 160. Sorry, 1060. So let's call 1060 subroutine. Okay, we're going to call this whole piece of paper here um, SCSI cd player basic okay so 
we have our routines, and we have our variables. Variables. We've just kind of laid them out like this, right? I don't know if you can see that. Routines, variables, name of program. So we have this sort of uh, 1060, and that looks like um, that looks like it's just the very first thing that uh, gets run. So char 147, char 14. Again, if we want to know exactly what those are, we can look those up in our handy uh, Petsky chart. So 14 uh, switches to text mode, and 147 decimal clears the screen. So we can, uh, so, okay, yep. So that's gonna uh, put her in text mode and clear the screen, which is exactly what it says right here, right? Clear the screen, and SB, um, maybe that's German. No, I'm not sure, that's lowercase, basically. So B, D, so now we have a variable. So B, D, so B, D, B, D is the um, boot device, yeah? Because that's what peak one, peak 186 is gonna, yeah, current floppy. So my guess is that B, D actually stands for boot device. Okay. Next, we have dimensions. So we got P, U, 9, T, D, 36, 7, that's a two-dimensional array, and P, E, percent, which is, um, these are for integers, not floats. Don't know how useful that is, but uh, P, E, percent, 512. So, what? So let's just write these down. We got P U nine. We got T D T D thirty seven thirty six comma seven two dimensional array, and we've got P E percent five twelve. So that's gotta be some sort of buffer. Yeah? PE must be some sort of buffer, 512 byte buffer. Um, so BL2352 rem, length of audio block. Okay, so BL is block length, right? We got BL block length. Um, SK session number, length of audio block, one, ah, I see, one seventy-fifth of a second. Okay, that's kind of cool, we can write that down just for fun, one seventy-fifth of a second. So SK, serial number, SK... Session number, sorry. Session... I don't know what that is. I don't know what a session number is. Session number. Next we have... Now, you might say, what, what, why are we writing these down? Why? Because these are initializing variables, and they're going to be used all over the place. So if we see a BL somewhere, it's like, we better damn well remember that it's a buffer length. Okay? By the time we're halfway down the code, we may forget what, what BL is for. But we've got it in our notes here now, so we know what BL is. Uh, so then we have MH and ML, which is the SCSI buffer high and low bytes. So my guess is that these are offsets into the hard drive. 
Let's pull the hard drive manual out again. I don't know what sort of... So we must have a memory map inside the hard drive. <clears throat> Lock commands. Where we got? We got a memory map around here somewhere? Yeah, here we go. Hard drive memory map. Let's grab our calculator. 48 for high and decimal. 48, that's the other thing I hate about basic. It's like, you know, it's way more convenient to work in hexadecimal. And basic, you know, they thought it was easier to work in decimal, but it ain't. It's much easier to work in hexadecimal most of the time. So that's gonna be 30. I see, I see, I see. So, uh, memory, lo low memory, so zero page, zero is here, FFFF is way up here, and 30, so 3,000, that's 48, is 3,000, is, lo and behold, the start of eight kilobytes of free RAM. Okay, so that's senso hava, as they say in Esperanto. That is sense having. Um, okay, so what do we got here? We got M H M H and M L for uh, SCSI buffer buffer and uh, high byte and SCSI buffer low byte and these together are going to be at 3000 why because that's 8k free mem okay glad we didn't have to figure that out all right dp data buffer pointer maybe 48 times 256 is that going to be an hexadecimal 48 well that we're in hex 48 times 256 it's going to give us something super friggin huge No, it's not. It's just 3,000 as a 16 byte, as a 16 bit number all on its own, obviously. So DP, SCSI data buffer, DP, SCSI data buffer. That's also 3,000. I don't know, I don't know what's going on there. I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just not sure. So then we have Z and L. And nobody has any idea what those are for. So Z and L, except that they appear to be 40 characters each. 40, 40 chars. 40 chars, Z and L. Yeah, we don't know what that is. All right, so then we have 60,000. So this, so, so, okay, line 1060 is probably uh, an it. Okay, next we have 60,000. It just goes to 60,000. So 60,000 It actually tells us main program. Main program. All right. Now, following main program, we have two thousand. Okay, so two thousand is what? SCSI command inquiry six byte. 
All right, let's put that down. SCSI, command. Inquiry, six byte. And that looks like it's gonna go, so <clears throat> it sets SC. That's a new variable we don't have yet. So SC dollar sign has got to be the SCSI command. SCSI command string. I need some coffee. All right, what's next? So what's this actually going to do? Char 18. You know what? I need this HD manual again, just to make sure, just to see if it makes any sense. commands, special loaders, crap, where was the page for SCSI commands? Was it before or after block? Direct access, block commands, here it is. The device number of the SCSI device, let's just leave this open over here. So we're basically, I'm basically just looking at this. What the heck is this? So char 18, what would 18 be? That'd be reverse, I doubt that's what it's for. Uh, and then we have LU, we don't have LU yet, times 32, char zero, char zero, char 32, char zero. So I have no friggin' idea what that means. One, two, three, four, Five, six. That is, in fact, six bytes. Um, but we'll note also that it simply go subs four thousand, and then returns. Remark send command. So let's call four thousand. The. Let's actually just. Let's scroll down here to 4,000 and see what we find. Let's not do that. Let's start at 4,000. Okay, so 4,000 is SCSI. Wow, look at that. Almost Esperanto looking word. Commando. Except for the double M, it would be the Esperanto word for command. SCSI command request sense six byte. 4000 is SCSI command request sense 6 byte. Now, my guess is that there is some sort of um, kind of protocol that you use. Like, you know that these status bytes that it says you get back are like check condition, target is busy, intermediate status, blah blah blah. Like my guess is it'll be a something vaguely like the way the 15 Ultimate 2 works where you have this kind of state machine and you you can send it, you can send the controller some sort of a command and then it tells you whether the device is busy or something like that. And the very reason that we're reverse engineering this is because I don't want to figure out how the hell that works. Um, and it's going to go sub 4110, which is the SCSI command. And then that'll return and come back. Request makes... Request sense. Request sense. Makes no sense for audio CD. Okay. Well then we don't know what that's for, do we? However, we do know 
4,110 is a SCSI command. Okay, so 4,110 is SCSI command. SCSI command, and this appears to be like the raw SCSI command, right? Send SCSI command. SCSI command, send. Okay. Yeah, so this actually does the, so this is kind of weird, in my opinion, the way the way this code is laid out, I gotta I got be honest. It's just weird to me, but whatever. Um, I just find it weird. Um, lots of go subs followed by returns. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. So we're gonna go sub 4160. That is gonna open DV. Huh, DV? Huh. We haven't even defined DV yet. That's weird. Um, obviously, it's going to be the boot device. Mm, is it the boot device? No, it's not the boot device. It's going to be the detected CMD HD device, which would have been in part of the 60,000 main program, but we haven't got there yet. Um, and this is the actual raw SCSI command. So SC, now we have our ID. Okay, let's put down more variables. So DV is going to be um, CMD HD dev number. ID must be what comes right out of here. ID must be the SCSI device number. So I D the SCSI device ID, perhaps. Perhaps that's why it's called ID. Followed by ML and MH, which we've already seen, to tell it to use the free 8 kilobyte buffer inside the hard drive. Followed by SC, okay, okay. So now we see exactly how SC is used, right? So in those previous commands, uh, such as this line 2000 SCSI command inquiry six byte, it is gonna set the string SC, but SC follows all this sh stuff. So SC does, has nothing to do with the SCSI device or the CMD hard drive's internal buffers. It's just the raw command. FE. That is going to be, since we're pulling one byte from 15, channel 15, FE must be the SCSI command's response code. I don't know why it's FE, but let's go with it. Might be German after all. F E dollar sign. Here's another kind of weird thing I find about basic. Although dollar sign is for strings, strings are really just arrays of bytes, and the byte values can be anything. So uh, while you might think, let's say that you want to have something like, oh, I want to have. Uh, the Petsky single byte command code for, uh, you know, making the screen red or something. It's like it's one byte, it's way below the level of characters. You can't store that one byte into like a number. It, you actually store those in strings because, I, I don't know, string, it's just weird to me that strings are almost more like ints, <laughs> in a way, strings of ints, whereas number variables in basic are not really ints, they're, they're floats, like they're these complex basic numbers. Okay, so FE is going to be the SCSI command complete 
location status. SCSI command completion status. Now where did I get that? Right from the CMD manual. Let's just put in here 939 manual. Okay. All right. So, and FE is the int version of that. number version. Okay. 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 So, basically we're going to grab from the channel FE, and if FE is a blank string, we set FE to zero, and then we go to 490, which is down here. Otherwise, if FE is not zero, then we grab the ASCII version of FE into FE. Okay, that's pretty basic. And then we close channel 15 and return. So, <clears throat> so 4,110 4, um, <clears throat> is going to call, send the SCSI command. And then it's going to grab the response code and, re and close the command channel and return. And upon returning, it's going to return right to here. And then we're going to say, okay, well, if FE is greater than zero, well, zero is not, zero is okay. If greater than zero, that means, uh-oh, the code was not okay. Maybe uh, the target is busy. Maybe it's in the middle of, uh, you know, whatever. The point is it's not okay. So what do we do? Well, we go sub to 4160 again. And we attempt to send the command again. But it only does that twice. Right? So it'll go sub to 4160. Boom. Try it out. And it'll return. And if the error was anything, if the, if the response code was anything but zero, it'll try once more. But after that second try, if the error code is still zero, well, it, it just returns. Okay? Okay. Now, we don't want to carry on from 5,000. We want to return to like uh, 2,000, 4,000 even. Let's go back to 4,000 just to see where we were. Okay. Okay, so 4,000 was the request sense six bytes makes absolutely no sense apparently according to this comment okay let me tell you something about basic this is stupid this pattern if you ever see go sub and then something and on the next line it says return this is this can be replaced this is the, the same pattern as you find in assembly where you have this trailing JSR and then immediately following the JSR, you have an RTS, and that's the end of the routine. If, unless you, unless the routine you're JSRing to, which I blogged about one time, is doing serious stack manipulation, it is identical and faster if you simply jump to the thing that you're going to immediately return from. Same here. Rather than go subbing 4110, and then having it return, and then immediately return again, just go to, and the return from the one below will return to wherever this return would normally go to, would normally return to. So <clears throat> that's just a that's just a comment.
Okay, so let's let's go back to even before 4,000 to 2,000, which is kind of where we were at up to that point. Let's just go from the start for a second here just to see if, okay, so 2,000 is our SCSI command inquiry, six byte. So now we know what's actually going on here. SC is gonna be the raw SCSI command, six bytes. We don't know what this stuff means yet because we don't speak SCSI, but it is going to go sub 4,000. And SCSI 4,000 essentially full is this request sense six byte thing which doesn't do a damn except fall through to 4,110, which is the true send command. So let's just go back to 4,100. Let's go back to 4,000, sorry. Like, honestly, I have no idea why the guy does that. I have no idea, no idea. I, I tend to get rid of crufty shit in my code if I, if I can. There, may, there might be a reason for that, but the way this program works, there's it's not doing anything to call 4,000 except wasting time. And then we have another return immediately following the go sub. So honestly, here, you want to do... Uh, sorry, it, it was here, yeah? So if you want to do an inquiry 6-byte, whatever the hell this thing is, really, it's just going to set the SC, and then it's just going to go to 4,110 that's it. Okay. 2,040. So these are kind of special. 2,040, I know I'm doing these out of order and I apologize. 2,040 is going to be test unit ready, 6 byte. SCSI command test unit ready 6 byte okay so this is going to do virtually the same thing yeah we, we pretty much know how this works now it's going to do this crazy SCSI command and this is going to go to 4000 in return okay and we don't quite know how that works yet we don't know how these work yet Next we have 2,400. Read table of contents, 10 byte. Okay, so let us write that down. 2,400 is gonna be SCSI command. Read table of contents, 10 bytes, 10 byte. I am actually interested in this because I want to know, ah, of course, of course. Okay, I understand already. I understand already. Okay, so here's how this works. I will explain it to you if you don't, if you haven't figured it out yourself. So <clears throat> you send a SCSI command to channel 15 and you send a you send a, a message to channel 50 you send a command to channel 15 the command is s dash c next so that's going to tell the controller okay well we got a SCSI command next we have a device a SCSI device number next we have a hard drive an internal to the CMD hard drive buffer address and that's going to be 3,000 hex for the 8K of free space. Next we have the SCSI command. The response on the error channel is only a single byte, one of these status bytes. So then I was thinking, okay, but how do we actually get the result of the SCSI command? Aha! The SCSI command will put the data, which is the result of the, oh, excuse me, the result of the actual command, it's going to write into the buffer that we specified. So basically, we run the command, 
and we can expect that the response to the command, the, 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 the actual data response to the command, will be stored at 3000 hex in the hard drive's RAM. And so to access the actual data, we can just do a memory read, which is exactly right, which is right here. So I don't know that I'm gonna get quite into this routine yet, um, except to say that I think we'll come back to this because there's a lot of variables in here that I don't quite understand yet, like LU, BL, have we seen that one yet? BL's block length, right. Um, so I'm, I don't wanna get into this yet, okay? Okay. So it, but it looks like the read table command 10 bytes going to go all the way down to uh, 26,000, 2600 something. Now here's another kind of cool thing that I notice about this code, and it is quite clever if I may say. I've never seen this before. By starting the line with a colon, colon is the basic command to separate uh, commands. By starting the command with a colon, this must trick the line parser into allowing spaces to follow it. So he's using the, the line starting with a colon to preserve space following the colon which allows for this nested indentation of the lines. Yeah? So inside this for loop is this TD, and then this next aligns with this for, and then this for, which is flush to the left, aligns with this next. So you know this next is for this for, and this next is for this for, and it, it, it actually adds some kind of, you know, C style uh, nesting. Very clever. Very, very clever. I like that idea a lot. Let's just continue on with routines without actually getting into trying to figure out how read table of contents works. So 2700. Oops. Typo on my paper. 2700 is play MFS. Play M F S. And what does MFS stand for? Mm. Okay, not sure. But what does it do? It sets this SCSI command and then it appends this SCSI command, which we don't understand yet. TD was one of our um, initialized two-dimensional arrays. God, I hope that TD doesn't stand for two dimensions. <laughs> TD, two dimensions. It may well just, but uh, let's, uh, let's, not, let's not pick on it too hard until we know. And then it appends a little bit more. So we don't know what that does, right? Play MFS just sends a big fat SCSI command that we don't understand yet. All right, next we've got 2800. 2800, read sub channel Read sub channel. Not entirely sure what a sub channel is. Let us do this so that we can see things case sensitively. Ah, I don't know what this stuff's gonna do. I don't know, except that it's printing out user interface stuff. So we're into user interface stuff here. Subchannel title number. And what is this going to do? Go sub 3600. We haven't reached that routine yet. Print title length. 
time and time remaining, okay, so time and time remaining are in here, which we saw was counting up when we were playing. So time and time remaining get printed out in the UI. Then we have more SCSI command. We have an actual SCSI command here, which we send. And then we check to see if Fe is greater than zero. That was our error status. TF. We don't know what TF is yet, do we? No. Okay, so this is reading subchannel. So after we send, ah, maybe this really is reading the time, the current, this is the, this is perhaps reading the time, the current time, because we get this UI, then we send these commands, then we do a memory read, PE, we already encountered PE, 512 bytes. So what the heck does PE stand for? But it is indeed reading, it is indeed doing a memory read of 15 bytes, maybe? And then we loop zero to 14, and then we set into PE the ASCII numbers that are coming back. So 15 might be enough for a couple of time codes, maybe. PP equals 13 times 4500. 4500 is probably related to seconds. 14, 70, ah yes. 75, it said 1 75th of a second, right? So 14 75ths of a second, 15 is divided by 5300 plus 0 0.004. This is definitely decoding the time. This is definitely decoding the time. Next, look at this. We are ghosts of 3600. We'll have to figure out what 3600 does, but it looks like P P must be play position. That is gonna be my guess. So P E so P P is almost certainly play position. Play position. Okay. Oh what the heck does 3600 do? Let's guess right off the bat that 3600 converts an int to a string maybe or something crazy like that. Why, why would I say that? Because, okay, so we print out some UI that says uh, time and time, current time, total time, current time. Then we uh, make this SCSI command then we do a memory read and we pull 15 bytes out and convert them into numbers in the PE buffer in memory. Then we uh, use a few key values like 13, 14, 15, and we do some multiplications that are time related. So we're basically converting. So this is going to be some, this is going to be some I mean, I've seen this in, I've seen this in like, you know, how do you convert a seconds based timestamp into units like years and days and months and all that stuff. It's like, that's what this is doing. This is going to be somehow converting into seconds and minutes or something. So how many, what is 60? No, no, no. Yeah, 60 seconds in a minute times 75 75ths of a second. Whoops, we're in hex. Decimal. 4,500. No, 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 no. 60 times 75. 
this 4500. That's exactly what it's doing. I mean, this, this 4500, this multiplication of 4500, and this division of 4500 is converting 70 fifths of seconds into um, minutes. Okay, and this Ah, okay, okay, hold on, so P, P, so A gets set to P, P, yeah? So, go sub 3600, my guess is that 3600, we'll see in two seconds, but my guess is that 3600 is probably a routine that converts an integer into... So an integer from A into a string, a dollar sign, that is formatted as minutes, colon, seconds. So that's my guess. 3600 is going to be a... This is also a common technique in BASIC, because you don't have input parameters to subroutines. If you want a subroutine like something that converts an integer of, into... Uh, minutes colon seconds it's like okay but you might have lots of different integers but you don't have input parameters so what do you do you say okay a will be the global parameter that 3600 takes as its input and a dollar sign will be its universal its global output and so before we call 3600 whatever variable we want to do to undergo the conversion We'll simply assign it to A and call 3600. So A is actually an input parameter for 3600. Then when 3600 returns, its output parameter is a dollar. So then this is going to go back up and over, probably to reposition itself after those time labels. And then it's immediately going to print out a dollars, and then clear a dollars for note for some weirdo reason. So A string, A string gets cleared. But the point is, it's going to put the freshly converted int a into this a string it's going to print it out after the label and then uh, exactly I know exactly what this is so pg will be the play total minus the play position to, to give you um, Yeah, the difference, right? Like um, the time that has elapsed so far, or something like that. The time remaining. That's what it is. It's going to give you the time remaining. So PG. PG must be the total play time. Again, I, I don't know. I don't know why the I don't know why they've chosen these variable names. Could be German. Could be that they just didn't know what they're doing. Or maybe the variable that they preferred was just not available. That happens a lot because everything's global. Thirty six hundred is going to be that conversion routine. Next we get X. Yeah. So whilst it's playing, play MFS, play MFS, I see. Let's go back to 2700, 2700. Does 2700 fall through to read subchannel? No, it doesn't. But that's okay. P A. What was P A? Mm -hmm. Here's our P G. So P E. So P G is P E minus P A. Uh -huh. We haven't figured it. Would. So let's just write these down. We got P E. 
we have p a. So we have this series of variables that starts with p, probably for play. p is probably position. g, I don't know. e and a. g is composed from e and a. e minus a divided by 4,500. Yeah, I'm not sure yet. Not sure. Again, TD, two dimensional array. Yeah. Title number. Title data. Ah. Yeah. TD might not stand for two dimensions. It might stand for title data. That would make a lot more sense. Let's pin that in temporarily. Title data or TOC data. Table of contents data. That is also very possible. Yeah, I see. I know, I know what that's, I know what's going on. It's two dimensional, 36 comma seven, because it's gonna support like up to 36 tracks. Track data, yeah, hold on, that's what it stands for. That is what TD stands for, track data. Much better than title data. Track data. Perfect. So the two dimensional <laughs> two dimensional array. God, I'm an asshole. Uh, whoever wrote this is probably face palming as I work my way through what this stuff does. TD is track data. We're at over an hour, but I'm having fun, so stay with me. TD is track data, two dimensionals. So <clears throat> basically when we do read in the table of contents, we're gonna have, we're gonna, there's basically seven bytes of data per track, which is probably the track length. Right, so those are the, so the first argument of track data will be the track number. So NR must stand for uh, current number. I don't know. But then five, it's like it's grabbing the fifth data byte from the track data for whatever is the current track. Multiplied by 4,500. And then we grab the sixth byte multiplied by 7,500. And then we grab the seventh byte. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yes, I know exactly how this works. So basically, uh, we'll have byte uh, seven is the least significant, six is the mid byte, five is the high byte. Big NBM. In fact, again, DM. Yeah. Well, who cares? Uh, so basically, the most significant byte is being multiplied by forty-five hundred because that is the number of seventy-fifths of a second in a minute. The next one is seconds. This is the number of 75ths of a second. And the final one is just the raw final 75ths of a second. Okay, so PA is the uh, play available. Was there an available? Was there an available? No. I don't think we've encountered MM yet, have we? No, I don't know what MM is. Times 4,500, that's our 75ths per second. Oh, minutes, minutes, MM is minutes. 
times 4,500, seconds times 75, plus DD, some fraction of a second. So MMSS and DD, they're kind of a group as well, right? MM, SS, and DD will be minutes, seconds, and DD is some sort of 175th of a second. 175th seconds. I've never heard of 175th as being a unit before, but who the hell knows, right? I don't, I don't know. I don't know why that would be. Actually, I know why that would be. If I were to guess, it would be based upon, let's just, I would, I, if I were to guess, why 175th? It would be based on the raw data uh, uh, storage of the PCM audio and the PCM audio data. And then uh, if you multiply that out by, uh, so let's say if you multiply that Or if you if you computed, okay, well, how much data would there be per second? And if you divide that by 75, it'll probably end up being a nice round number. So let's try that, just for fun, right? So we'll go 44,100 is the kilohertz. CD audio is 16-bit, uh, 44.1 kilohertz uh, stereo. So we'll go 44,100 times 2 times uh, two again for bytes, 16 bits, two. So that's going to be 1,760,400 bytes per second. 1764, so we gotta flip over to complex mode. 17600 divided by 75, is precisely 2,352 bytes and magically what is 2,500 and 2,352 bytes it is BL am I right we'll come back to 2,800 look at this Look at this, BL, 2,352, length of an audio block. Yeah, all right. Now, why exactly 2,352 is the length of an audio block? Uh, there's probably some, some, some overhead checksums or something. Okay, does that make sense? Let's go back to 2800. I love it when things make sense. Love it. As soon as things make sense, I'm, I'm happy. Oh yeah, okay. So we're back to... We're back to what's going on here, right? So PE... Minutes times 4500, seconds times 75 plus DD. PG is going to be PE minus PA divided by 4500. A equals PG. So here we do this A is PG title length. PG is definitely the total. Goes to 3600, it's going to convert it to a string, and then we print it out title length of the string. We only have to do that once because it doesn't change. L, print L. Ah, yeah, right. L was just that 40 characters blank. Blank space. 40 characters blank space. 
And Z was 40 characters of dashed space, if we recall from the beginning. Dashed space like this. Right. So LLL is going to go clear, clear, clear. Yeah, that, that actually makes sense. LLL. This is literally going to clear the following three lines. This, by the way, is the fastest way that you can clear, because basic is slow as shit, but print is actually pretty darn fast. So if you pre-buffer a string, like 40 characters of spaces, and then you say print, and it goes it, it can clear one line by overwriting it with 40 spaces rather quickly. I know this from IP Thief basic game I was working on, I am working on. So clear, clear, clear. And then we print out this shit and then we grab the, uh, and then we grab the current time. And then we convert the current time, we figure out where it is relative to it, and we print back over top of the lines we cleared. So we clear the lines and then we print out a label and then we grab the data from the memory, from the SCSI command and the memory read convert it into, a, uh, into a, something meaningful, cursor up and over just past the label, and spit out the result. Immediately after spitting out the result, we have to do some sort of MFS. This is all in MFS? No, this is in read subchannel. Okay, well, it's weirdly named subroutine. <coughs> However, X is basically, okay, so let's call XS is basically our input here. X string is our key press. Key press input. Okay. So, so this is inside the loop, right? So it's playing. It's polling the device for the time and, out, and spitting the time out. Then inside that time polling code loop, it checks to see, it pulls to see if you've pushed a key. If it's this back arrow, then it goes t equals lk plus one goes to 2990, which returns, again, what the fuck, why do you fucking do that? Okay, pardon my language. Why do that? Why go to 2990 just to return? I mean, just put the word return there. <laughs> my God. Okay. Um... Yeah, so this LK plus one equals cancel. It's like T. We haven't recorded T yet either, have we? But it's as though T is some sort of. We don't know what T is going to be. T is some sort of. It's some sort of. LK plus one T is the title. How does this work? So if we put back arrow, we want to cancel. But in order to cancel, what we want to do is change the track perhaps to something beyond the end it's maybe maybe because otherwise if we didn't push a back arrow we're just gonna do a plus we're gonna check and see if we did a plus if we did a plus then we bounce down to 2990 again instead of just returning but that'll be next title felt like a German Look at this. Here's title spelt incorrectly twice, only to be spelt correctly on the very next line. That's funny. 
I'm not picking on people for whom English is a second language. I, I'm honestly not. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just playing around when I say things, when I point things out like that. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. So it's actually not this. This whole this whole read sub channel itself is not looping, but rather it is a unit of a loop. So it's going to clear some lines, spit out the size of the track data, do the polling and spit out where you are, check some keyboard input, adjust this T value, possibly, probably, and then return with, you know, a new T value or something. P E one, if it's not equal to 21, Minus T. I have no idea what's going on here. T equals T minus two minus T equals one. Oh, I see. Oh, that's very clever, isn't it? I think I know what's going to happen here. I've never seen this construction in basic before. Oh, I love this. I love learning new things. T equals one is going to resolve to either uh, maybe zero if it's true and then this is going to be like minus two minus zero uh, I think this is a fancy way to prevent the track from falling below zero all in one step. Yeah, it's gotta be what it's doing. Let's take a break on that one. Hold on. Yeah, I love that. Oh my God. Let's go, uh, let's go A equals uh, 99. Okay, just to see that A is actually 99. Now we'll go uh, T equals two T so now we'll go uh, a equals T equals one Let's see if this makes any sense will that be a syntax error no I love it so a has become so it's not 99 anymore a has become zero Right, because t was not equal to one, it was equal to two, and so this resolves to zero, and so a becomes, so this little thing basically resolves to zero. Okay, now let's try that again. So now we'll go, let's print t, which should be two. So now we'll go t equals one. No, we're gonna, yeah, we'll go t equals one. What's a equal to? Okay, well we gotta set A equal to something else just to see what A is equal to. Okay, so A is now 99. So now we're gonna say A is equal to T equals one, which it is now. And then we're gonna say, so A should be equal to one. Oh, of course. Oh my God, it's even cleverer. It's minus one. I love it. Wow. All right, let's go back to line two eight hundred. Oh wow, what a great trick. That is a great trick. So you hit minus. Of course, here's what I would have done. T equals T minus one. No. Uh, uh, I mean, what I would have done is t equals t minus 1. And then I would have said, if t less than 0, t equals 0. Or if t less than 1, t equals, or if t equals 0, t equals 1. But the problem with doing that kind of thing is that it takes up a lot of space. And, you know, following a then 
if you have another if you have another if following a then but the if fails you can never go past it to a go to unless you put the go to on the next line so it, this is very clean okay so we go t equals t minus 2 so let's say that t is 1 so we're going to go t minus 2 would be and then minus zero. No. If it's true, it will be minus two minus two. Would be just a seven. So if it's false, this will be zero. So two minus zero will be two. T minus two will be minus. It will go less than two. Sorry, but if T is equal to one, well then this will be minus one, and two minus minus one will be two plus one. So it will be, no, but it's not gonna do it in that order. It'll resolve this first, then it will come back here and it'll resolve this in order from left to right. Brackets, then left to right. So it's gonna say t equals one. So if t equals one is not true, like let's say it's t5 and you're trying to go back, this will be zero. So we'll go t minus zero, t minus two minus zero. It's still gonna bring t back two. Okay, but if t is equal to one, well then, T will be minus two, but then it'll be minus minus one. So it'll be plus one. It's gonna be minus two plus one, which is gonna be just minus one. So if T's already one, it's only gonna go back, it's always gonna go back some. But it'll go back one if T is greater than one. And if T is equal to one, which I'm assuming is the lowest number, the lowest track number then it'll only decrease by one, only one step. I, s I love this, but I'm not quite sure why T is allowed to drop less, T is allowed to go under. I mean, this is always gonna cause T to go either minus two and then minus zero, or it's gonna be minus two plus one. So it's always gonna go minus either two or minus one. I don't know how T is used yet though. All right, that's cool. I like that. All right, yeah, so something's gonna call all this once and then the result will, will be returned and then some work will be done on it to possibly stop the music. But if it's not been stopped or the track hasn't changed, well then it's just gonna probably call right back in to read the subchannel because the music is still playing. All right. Okay, so 3100. Let's just put a note on read subchannel. This basically um, checks time available, time remaining, and pulls for stop or track change input. Okay. Excuse me. 3100. 
There's a whole other routine, which he hasn't says is a SCSI command, but it is. So let's say that's a SCSI command. How do we know it's a SCSI command? Because it goes sub 4000. command start stop start stop unit I'm not sure what that unit refers to that start stop the music I'm not sure 3500 oh we're almost at 3600 here aren't we yeah these are conversions I mean all of these are conversions look at this one hundredth of a minute a second. Yeah. Okay, so these are now conversion routines. All grouped together. So 3500 is MFS to LBN. MFS to LBN. 35. 40 of 3550. 35, oops, 35, 40, 450 is LBN2MFS, the inverse of the one before it. And 3600, which we just visited, we just talked about, 3600 is some sort of minute conversion. One, I wasn't expecting this 100th thing though. 100th of a minute to seconds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One hundredth of a minute to seconds. Yeah, it had to be some form of conversion to seconds because the multiplication by 40... Oh, what does this do here? Hold on. Because it does put in this... Minute to second, one hundredth minute to second. So in A, B, C is A minus B times sixty divided by a hundredth, divided by a hundred. C times a hundred. What's wrong with just inlining this instead of having to do it on two lines like that? It's just slower, right? It's just slower. I don't know why you would do this. Okay. What time are we at? 20 after 2. We may have to split this into two videos. C int C times 100. B two colon zero mid star of C two two. Yeah, well multiplying by sixty and dividing by a hundred and then multiplying by a hundred. I don't know. 
I mean, it is the conversion. I mean, it is setting this A dollar, this A string rather. And it's definitely setting it up so that this is the minutes section, and then you have a colon, and then this is the seconds section. So I'm a little rusty on this math, but I know that it's converting it to minutes, colon, seconds. Okay, and then we're just into this, which we've already seen before. 4,000 is sending our command, jumping to request sense, which makes no sense according to the command, and then jumping, and then doing this crap, and then jumping down here to actually send the command. All right. 5,000, then, would be to scan the bus for CMD. Okay, so 5,000. Now, a bunch of this crap I'm never going to have to do in, CM, in uh, C64 OS. Why? Because I already have, like, a relocatable component thing that gets run at boot time and used by the drives utility to, to build a detected drives table. So we don't have to actually do any of this code that searches for a CMD hard drive. I mean, we could just look at the detected drives table. Okay, but you know, again, this is one of the things that's like, oh, if you write a program from scratch for basic, it's like, oh, you have to figure out how to detect drives. Whereas if you write something for an operating system, it's like, you don't have to detect drives, just reference the drive table. And not only that, but the drive table detects all the drives, and it detects them very reliably, and and you can turn a drive off and rerun the drives utility and change that table in, at, at runtime. You know, I mean, it's, I like operating systems. I'm a fan. So 5000 was basically scanning the bus for, so scan bus for CMDHD. I've actually already reviewed this code earlier. I don't even care how it works, honestly. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. You know, it also does terrible things. I may as well tell you what it does. It's like, okay, so we start with our uh, G. What the hell, fuck? I don't know what this G is for. G, A? But anyway, it's... We're going to four loop over 8 to 30. Those are the valid drives. We're going to test drives 8 to 30. Now what we do is we try to open channel 15 on a device. And then we immediately close it and we check the status byte. Okay, that's kind of cool. But in C64 OS, you would never just try and open and close the command channel because doing so is not good in the context of an operating system because closing command channel uh, closes all the open files and all that stuff. Basically, the detection routine opens channel 15, assigns it a special uh, logical file number so that the channel can always be found and, and accessed. You never close it. It only ever gets closed when the device gets turned off. But this is how this is doing it. Checks to see if the status is 128, negative 128. If it is, if it is uh, not 128, then it has detected a device. And so what does it do? It reopens channel 15 and sends a UI command which resets the device. That's gonna change the current partition. I mean, fuck, right? Like what, what is UI gonna do? I'm not sure if it will reset the current partition on a CMD hard drive, actually, I take that back. But still, still. And then it reads in, it reads everything in and it searches to see whether CMDHD is in the string at a very specific location. And if it is, you found your hard drive. Yeah. 
So dv, which we already, so this is actually what sets dv. Yeah, we already determined that dv must be the, here's what our list now looks like. All kinds of cool stuff. We know what all these variables are for. We have all these routines that we can jump between. Okay, so <clears throat> that's how it figures out with the device. Okay, now this matters. This is super cool. So 5200, 5200 is scanning the SCSI bus. I don't know how to do this, okay, for SCSI devices. How do we do this? So, we redeclare DP. That's the data pointer. SCSI data buffer. I'm going to change that. I called it a buffer before. It's not a buffer, it's a pointer. SCSI data pointer. Right. It says right here, Dotten Poofer. <laughs> uh, love it. SCSI Dotten Poofer. So that's the data pointer. DP. Dotten Poofer. Ah, Poofer. Fuck. Poofer's not pointer. Poofer is buffer. Poofer. Buffer. Poofer. Poofer. Yeah, Poofer. Dot and buffer. Data buffer. Look, I'm learning German. Fuck. Why did I just change that? You know what? I'm going to leave that calling it data, po data pointer. DP. Yeah, DP doesn't stand for data pointer, but data puffer. Now, why are we redefining these? Like, what is up with that? We defined MH, ML, and DP at the very friggin' beginning. Why are we doing it all over again? I don't know why. Okay. Init high byte and low byte with a SCSI buffer. Okay, we've already done that. SDSL. That is got to be SCSI device and unit, a loon, logical unit, l -un stands for logical unit, SCSI ID and logical unit. Let us write those down. So S D is SCSI ID. And L, oh, sorry, SL, SL is logical unit, SCSI logical unit, which matters somehow. So we start, LU must be logical unit. Is that what I just said? No, hold on. Logical unit temporary slash search. SL probably only stands for the logical unit while searching for it. But up here where we have, same with SD. SD, oh, that's the SCSI ID. No, that's searching for the SCSI ID. SL is searching for the logical unit but we ultimately resolve it to these ones up here. So these ones we're searching. We ultimately resolve it to these ones up here. The hard drive, device number of the CMD hard drive, the ID of the SCSI device number, and LU almost certainly because it's paired with ID here. LU will be the SCSI 
dev logical unit. Okay. This is also search. That's temporary or search. Okay. Okay, so now we can actually start to use some of the stuff that we have done. Okay. So 2000, yeah, he's got a comment here. It's an inquiry. It's a six byte inquiry, in fact. Okay. I see. I see what the inquiry is now. Yeah, indeed. Inquiry is part of scanning the buff. The bus, pardon me. Right, 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 right. Where are we here? 5200, scanning the bus. Let's just drop back to 2000 for a second just to see how that inquiry worked. Yeah, right. So here's what's going to happen. So the six so the inquiry is going to be logical unit times 32. 0, 0, 32, 0, 18. So 18 might be some sort of a, an inquiry command. Logical unit times 32. Zero, zero, thirty-two, zero, and then we send that off to four thousand, which is the actual command for fifty-two hundred. Whoops, fifty-two hundred. Scanning the bus. By the way, it's Jiffy DOS that lets you hold Control and push S to lock the screen which is totally friggin' awesome because you can write and you can point at the screen without having to constantly hold control. Um, let's see here. Dot and puffer. So we start with device zero, logical unit zero. Then we start by assigning our final ID and LU as these initial values. Okay. Then we go sub 2000. Okay, so maybe go sub 4000, which was the actual command. 4,110 is the command we actually care about. Maybe it's going to use ID and LU. So let's check out 4,010. What's it going to do? Definitely uses ID. LU was used in the inquiry command. So it's sending it to the zeroth device, then it's sending the LU inquiry command. It's LU times 35. And then it's just checking FE and returning, and then that's gonna return again. So we're gonna be now at, let's just go back to 5200. So it's gonna start by inquiring Sending a command to device zero with some sort of inquiry command for logical unit zero. And then FE will be zero if it's okay. If it is not okay, then we jump down to 5570. If it's not okay. Up to 5570, which is right here. Aha. Uh -huh. 5570 
So it's not okay to skip all this shit. And instead, we, s we do the search logical number equals search logical number plus one. If the search logical number equals eight, then the search logical number equals zero, and the search device becomes search device plus one. Print out a dot to show that we're doing something. And then, if the search device is less than eight, because there are only devices zero to seven, then go back to 5260, which reassigns ID and logical unit and does the inquiry again. Right. Okay, that is very cool. And so if the response from the drive is zero, that's an okay. That means the inquiry for this particular device that we're on, zero, so we're going to start at drive zero, we're going to start at SCSI ID zero, and we're going to go up to SCSI ID seven. And for each one of those, we're going to search for logical number starting at zero, and we're going to go up to logical number eight, so zero to seven. Okay? So we have basically device SCSI IDs zero to seven. And within a device ID, we have logical unit numbers zero to seven. And they're based two nested loops. And for each one of those, we're gonna inquire to see if it exists. And if we get a response for the drive that says okay, then some response from that inquiry command will have been plopped into the buffer. And so we can do a memory read from the buffer of just one byte, which is what it says here, right? Read one byte. And then we can get ty, which is type. TY's gotta be type. TY string, again, because it's gonna be some byte value that's like we talked about before. So, SCSI device type. Or, they can call that class type or class, and ty is going to be the numeric version of that, number version of that, okay, now this is cool because this is exactly how I'm going to have to do it in assembly, yeah, so basically we, uh, We make the inquiry command. <coughs> if the response is zero, then we do a memory read from one byte. I'm pretty sure that, like, we can look up this memory read if we really wanted to, but I'm pretty sure I understand how that works. Memory read. Real-time clock, memory read must come after, direct access, allocating blocks, writing blocks, reading blocks, block pointer, block read, memory read. Here we are. Yeah, this is it right here. Reading from drive memory. You got your low byte memory address, you got your high byte memory address, you got your number of bytes to be read. The value for the number of bytes to be read can be read from, uh, can the number of bytes that can be read from can be from zero to 255. Since it is improbable that you would want to read zero bytes of drive memory. And it is also likely that you may wish to read 256 bytes. The value of zero has been altered to mean 256. 
Yeah, I do precisely the same thing with my RU detection. Precisely the same thing. Okay. After, here's the, here's the point. After a memory read command is sent, the specified bytes are returned over the error channel. Thus, you may use the get command to read these bytes one at a time. And that is exactly what is being done. So, we basically do memory read from our 3000 hex buffer, but we only want to grab one, which is basically saying read from 3000 and drop one byte into the error channel. And we immediately follow that up with reading one character from the error channel. And we get it into type. Now if type is blank, then we say type is zero. And we skip this. However, if it's not blank, then we do this and we end it with 31. So we're basically lowering the upper three bits three bits? Upper two bits. Basically we lower the upper two, we clear the upper two bits for some reason. Who the hell knows why, but we can do that in assembly nice and easy. Close the channel. Now, if the type is not five, then 55 uh, go to 5570, which does this incrementing, printing of the dot, and searching again. But if it is 5, then what do we do? If it's 5, if it's I mean, uh, a, 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 a CD-ROM must be type 5, yeah? CD-ROM type equals 5 must be the case. I just don't understand what's going to happen here. So, logical unit... will thus be set equal to the searched logical unit. Although I don't quite understand because it's already set to the searched logical unit here, right? And the ID will be set to the searched ID, but that's already been set here. But then, Search logic. Oh, I see. Fuck. What the fuck? Why does anybody fucking do this? God, that makes me. just hurts my fucking brain. <laughs> Immediately after setting LU and ID, which I swear to God are already set. Because look, this when this loops, it loops back to 5260 and it sets ID and LU. So I don't know what the fuck those are being set for again. They're already set. But then, you overwrite the search L and the search uh, D as 7 and 8, and then we increment 7 so that now it's equal to 8, but then that causes us to equals 0, so that, so then we so we increment SL, so that becomes 8, but then we say if it is equal to 8, which we it is, well then we're going to take SL and we're going to wrap it back around to 0, fine. But that just allows us to proceed to taking SD and setting it to 9. And then 
If it's less than 8, we go to 52, 60. But that's going to fail and it's going to fall through. And what the fuck? All you have to do is motherfucking return here. <laughs> like, why on earth do people do shit like this? This should just say, if type, this literally could be reduced to if type equals 5, then return! But that is what it does. All right. That's cool. We know how it works. That's two hours. I don't think anybody wants to watch this for more than two hours. Let us call this uh, the first part. And we'll just review what we have here. And we will come back to this tomorrow night. So we've got routines, the init routine, the main program. Then we have these SCSI commands, an inquiry, a test unit ready, a read table of contents, a read subchannel. And then we have sending the actual SCSI command. Play MFS, not quite sure what that means. We've got a SCSI command to start and stop the unit, not sure. And then we have these conversions, MFS to LBN, LBN to MFS, and we have conversion to from some long integer into minutes, colon, seconds. And then we have the routine for scanning the hard drives, scanning the bus for the hard drive, which we don't need. And we've got the very useful routine for scanning the SCSI bus for SCSI device numbers by their type. And then we have all of these variables, boot device, PU, no idea. Play unit, perhaps. Track data. PE, not sure. Block length, session number. The SCSI buffer, high and low bytes. The data pointer, the dot and poofer. We have these dashed line UI quickly print. Spaced blank line UI quickly print. We have our SCSI command string that gets built for every command. We have our hard drive device, our SCSI device ID, our SCSI logical num number. Then we have our uh, FE. This is our SCSI command uh, result status byte. Then we have our play position, total play time, and a couple other play related time lengths. We have our minutes, seconds, and 175ths of a second. We have our key press input. We have something related to control. Controlling what you want to do. Like, do you want the track to go forward? Do you want the track to go back? What do we want the track to... Oh, I understand how that T works now. Yeah. I understand that this is it's a command it's it's basically it's not actually it's a command it's okay we'll see it tomorrow but I think I understand how that T were that was that cool trick we learned we have our uh, and then we have some some uh, search related temporary variables all right so let's leave it there for tonight thanks for watching